Hey everyone, welcome to Along Those Lines. I'm your host, Scott Hoffman. This is a podcast about America's electric cooperatives, the work they do, the challenges they face. Today we're going to be talking about rural broadband. This is a topic that's been compared to the historic push for rural power in the 1930s. Billions of federal dollars have been allocated to help kickstart the broadband effort. There's even some folks who say that access to to high-speed internet could determine whether communities, certain communities, survive into the future. The question is, is it the right move? It's a question that the co-ops across the country uh, are wrestling with. Uh, And to help sort it out, we have two broadband experts in the studio. First, we're going to hear from Mike Kaiser. He's the, uh, the CEO of Bark Electric Cooperative. They're in the middle of uh, an ambitious 100% fiber to the home project uh, in their territory down in southwest Virginia. And then later on the podcast, we're going to hear from Brian O'Hara. He's the NRECA point person on broadband. First up, we have Mike Kaiser. It's great to have you here in the studio. Welcome to the podcast. It's good to be here. I've listened to a lot of podcasts, but I've never been on one, so I'm excited to participate in this. <laughs> well, welcome. RE Magazine ran an article about the, the Bark Electric Fiber Project. And I don't know if you know this, it has gotten an enormous amount of attention, and we've gotten a ton of feedback from it. And we've run uh, broadband articles before, but this is unique. There's something going on. I had no uh, idea. Yeah, and I, yeah, you may not have heard, but it came out when we were at the Connect conference, and I kept having people come up to me saying, "Can I get a copy of the RE magazine?" And it, it's wow. it's unique, and it made me think that there's something going on in in your experience. Are you seeing this in the conversations that you're having? Is there more? Is there more interest uh, in terms of the co-op world? Yeah, in terms of how whether to actually pursue a project, or whether they can, whether they want to, whether they should. I think so. Yeah, um, I think. Two or three years ago, I would have said, no, there still seems to be a bunch of sort of first movers that are working on this. But it seems like we're reaching this tide where everybody's now talking about it at every conference you go to. CEOs are coming up and asking me questions um, at our statewide level, too. It's on the front burner of everybody's plate right now. Talk about the process that you went through, because I know you're a, a smaller co-op, 10 to 13,000 meters. I think there's a lot of folks who represent co-ops of, of roughly the same size who are wrestling with the idea of whether this is the right way to go. I know it wasn't necessarily a, a smooth transition. Talk about how that went. So we uh, we did kind of the traditional model of hiring a company to do a feasibility study, then went and tried to poke holes in that feasibility study with a second consultant because we really wanted to try to reduce the risk in the project. So we thought if we brought it to another consultant, they could show us where we might have flaws or incorrect assumptions about the build costs or about the operating costs or the revenue model, whether that was accurate or not. Once we finally had a plan we were comfortable with and moving forward on, my initial thought and and the mandate from our board of directors was, and you got to remember this is several years ago now, so it's a different world in, in a in a sense. But can we can we do this? Can we build the project without encumbering the electric utility or put any risk on the electric ratepayers? And so I went setting about to try and do that. So we went to CoBank, CFC, our U.S. Telecom program, and basically found that that's virtually impossible. Mm-hmm. That nobody's going to lend to you at a reasonable interest rate and not encumber the electric assets or, or ask for a guarantee from the parent if right. you do it through a subsidiary. And we finally got to the point as a co-op where the board said, look, this is going to revitalize our community. This is our mission. This is what we did 80 years ago. You made a really good effort to try and find a way to not encumber the electric utility or put risk on it, but we need to just go. This is too important to the community and to the co-op. And the smart grid program was just starting it through the electric side. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were the number two borrower behind Midwest Energy in, in Michigan through the RUS electric smart grid program. It's worked out great. I mean, it, as far as I know, it's the lowest possible interest rate you can get for building fiber out to your substations and your meters. When you have a project that's, you know, mo- many millions of dollars, interest expense is a big sensitivity point in your operating model. Are you able to point to any kind of concrete examples of how this has made a difference within the territory so far? Yeah, I can, I can point to a couple of examples. So the first one is, uh, you know, we went and bid on the E-rate contract for the Rockbridge County School District. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rockbridge County previously had had some schools that didn't have fiber connectivity. An elementary school is one of them. And we won the E-rate contract because we were able to, to offer fiber services to all their properties. And so this elementary school that previously had about 5 meg DSL connection that everybody in the school had to share. They're now on a 250 meg fiber circuit to the school. 
the administrator of the school district told me just recently that once they knew they had fiber going to that school, they went out and purchased 1,800 tablets for the kids in the school district to be able to use because now there's connectivity and the kids have access to the internet that they didn't have before. That's amazing. It's really transformational. Yeah. yeah. You had mentioned in uh, the RA Magazine article that we that we ran in May that you could see a time when the revenues from your broadband operation, Bark Connect, might actually outstrip your electricity sales. Does that make you nervous at all? Is that is that something you, you think is still a possibility? I think it's an inevitability, actually, Scott, honestly. I think there's just so much of a hunger out there that we've seen with consumers who are in our service territory who, who want this. I mean, it's the single biggest question we get asked every single day is, yeah. when's it coming to my house? Right. Um, and even people outside of our electric service territory contact us and ask us when it's coming to their house. And we have to tell them sometimes, well, you're not a Bark member and we don't have plans to go to your neighborhood right now. You know, And they get mad at us. Yeah. It's like, move into our service territory. Then. <laughs> but I do see that coming. If it keeps growing at the pace it's going to grow and the demand is still out there for it, it'll happen. And I've always felt like that's not a bad problem to have. Yeah. You know, you, There's worse problems to have than you're violating the 8515 test and you have to decide whether you're going to become taxable or not. Right. The decision making in terms of going outside your territory, you've already d- done some connectivity outside your normal electric service territories. We correct? did because yeah. we're six and a half, roughly six and a half customers per line mile. Right. And so in order to boost that average density up, we've been blending some non-BARC areas with BARC areas. Okay. We'll continue to do that to try and boost the... I don't want to say profitability, but in a sense it kind of is because we're going to take those margins that we get off those initial highly dense areas and we're going to put them back into the project so that we can get out to the areas later on, phases two and three, where it's only three customers per line mile. Actually, let's talk about your territory a little bit because I think some of our co-ops probably have sort of the same issues where not only the density, but just the terrain kind of drives away other potential providers of this. Talk a little bit about Bark's territory and how you guys uh, kind of navigated that uh, to get to the decision to go with Bark Connect. If we can do this, if we prove this to be successful, anybody in the country should be able to do this. Yeah. I mean, literally. Okay, we, we've got probably the most rugged service territory in the whole country. You know, if you look at, at, look at us on a map, a small portion of our territory, maybe about a third of it, is in the Shenandoah Valley. Okay, so that's decent, but the county is called Rockbridge County, which right. means there's tons of rock everywhere, <laughs> okay? We also serve up to the Blue Ridge Mountains. So we're, we're up in the mountains to the east, mm-hmm. and then to the west, about two-thirds of our territory is George Washington National Forest. Right. So it is a lot of trees. <laughs> our single biz- biggest expense is right-of-way trimming, a very high-cost service territory. So if we can make this work, if we find a model that, that works for us, I mean, I feel like anybody who doesn't have those geographical challenges that we have should be able to do it. And one of the things you mentioned in the RA Magazine piece was not only attracting businesses that would otherwise pass your territory over, but also young people who maybe live in the suburbs of Washington and decide, well, now I can move into this territory because I can actually do work from home. Is it working? I don't. I think it's a little too early to tell on that. I've heard anecdotal things from like the realtors that they're using our, our sign-up tools to be able to, to market their properties that are for sale, saying they're now fiber ready mm-hmm. um, and, that, and they're using that. But I think it's too early to tell if people are going to be moving back into our area. I have gotten inquiries from customers or prospective people that'll say, we're looking to buy a house. We really need a definitive to know whether this is going to be inside or outside the fiber project area because right. we won't buy it if it's not in the fiber project area. Right. So it's going to take time. Yeah. I think the bigger thing is keeping the kids here who are going to school who don't really want to leave, but they never really had an opportunity to stay and, and have a gainful employment. Right. If we can do something to help spur some economic growth and keep them in, that would be a big win too. I don't think we're going to ever get like, you know, an Amazon distribution center or a Microsoft data center. You know, that's like manna from heaven. But if we can get small businesses going in our area, I think that's a win. Yeah. That kind of segues nicely into this broader picture of what, what this means to not only your service territory, but what are we talking about as a broad economic and quality of life impact that this has on rural communities across the country. My friend Bob Hans at Midwest once said to me that it is as close as we're going to get to what it felt like to turn people's lights on for the first time. And I've told that to our employees, too, before in our meetings. I've said, you know, I know that you're being asked to take on additional responsibilities that you didn't have to do. But think about how unique of a situation that you're in. In the history of BARC, entire generations of people came through this cop who just basically maintained the status quo, right? 
you guys are experiencing things that the people who founded Bark are experiencing in a different way, yeah. but it's the same sorts of things. Like what we're doing is changing customers' lives for the better. Uh, people who've never had high-speed internet before or have had something, you know, satellite or bad DSL are now getting like access to being connected. And I'm thinking about how unique that is. In your career that at Bark, you're going to have that experience that very few people have had. We actually had a customer recently. It's going to be in our next Co-op Living magazine. We're going to publish her piece because it was so nice, thanking us for connecting her to the internet. And she said, isn't it amazing that as the original founders of Bark were building out poles and wire to people, that one day they'd be connecting everybody to the world uh, with the same facilities. And I never really thought about that way, but that is kind of an amazing thought. Yeah. Have you had any trouble finding technicians and the right talent to staff up the fiber operation? We haven't. We get more applications than we can hire right now. People who are in the area that are looking to leave a cable television or a telco, right. and they want to come work for yeah. us. Um, and like in that article that was in RE Magazine, right. Josh, we hired Josh, you know, who was a, a local boy who was trying to come home, but there was no job for him right. until we created Bark Connects. Mike, I want to thank you for, for stopping by the studio and, uh, and and talking to us on along those lines. Thank you very much. Good luck with the rest of the project and, and, and come back and see us when you get done and we get an update on how it went. So next up, we have Brian O'Hara in the studio. He's the Regulatory Issues Director at NRECA. Part of his job is to make sure that co-ops have a level playing field when the federal government creates these programs that impact rural broadband. Brian, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, so NRECA has made rural broadband one of its kind of overarching strategic priorities, helping co-ops decide if this is the right thing for them. Talk about why this is such an important issue at this particular time. Well, it's a great question, and broadband is increasingly important to uh, our membership here at NRECA. There's a couple reasons for it. First and foremost, it is becoming increasingly difficult for electric utilities to manage their electric grid without a robust communications backbone. So there is a need for a broadband backbone just to support their own electric operations and improve efficiency there. Second is they serve, obviously, rural communities that are underserved and unserved with broadband. Uh, and that has harmed the economic development and growth of their communities. And as we all know, one of the goals or missions of an electric co-op is economic development of their community. So uh, there's a couple fold questions there. And our colleagues down in BTS recently did a report on what the economic value of having that backbone just to the electric grid operations is. And they estimated that having a broadband backbone, a co-op can save between 1.7 and 2. Point, I think it was $4 million a year in uh, reduced costs just from operational savings, having that backbone. Electric co-ops are particularly well-placed to provide this rural broadband. Talk about why it is that electric co-ops in particular uh, have an advantage here, or, or and I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say obligation, but is it, is it a strategic advantage in these particular environments? Yeah, it is a strategic advantage, and that's a good way to put it. Number one, they're already serving these rural communities and rural areas with a infrastructure-heavy um, electric grid. So it's not that different to run electric wires out there as it is to run telephone wires. So they're very similar in that regard as far as the building out of the infrastructure. And obviously that's something they're very familiar with. Also, they own the poles, they own a lot of the infrastructure. So adding additional cables to existing infrastructures makes it a lot easier than if you were starting from scratch, if you were a competitor coming from the outside. So that's what really helps give them kind of a leg up in uh, in this environment and building out to these rural communities. Yeah. Your job is is primarily to lobby the federal agencies for to make sure that the playing field is level for co-ops who do want to get in into broadband. I know there's a lot going on in this in this space right now. Talk about some of the bigger challenges that you're facing uh, with the agencies and, and on the Hill as well. Yes, there are a, a number of challenges. Deploying broadband in rural areas is very expensive. If it was easy, it would have been done a long time ago. So a lot of problems. So one of the biggest challenges we face is getting recognized uh, by some of these federal agencies as a player in the field. Obviously, the Federal Communications Commission historically has only dealt with the telephone companies, right? So we're a new player coming in there. Uh, I think it took them a while to kind of see us as legitimate and people that can help solve this problem. Uh, we're getting pretty far down the line. They are starting to see us that way. Uh, most recently, there was a Connect America Fund phase two auction, reverse auction, to get broadband out to uh, underserved communities out there. And we were, we had 31 electric co-ops win uh, $225 million over 10 years in that auction. And so I think there was 103 total winners. So, you know, we were about a third of that. 
Uh, that's not a, a small feat, and there will be some other auctions coming up down the way, and I think that now that they see us as a player, I think we'll be uh, able to work with uh, the FCC even more to try to get rules that are more advantageous to our equal participation. And then there's the uh, Rural Utility Service, where our members have historically done a lot of work and worked with them, mainly on the electric side. But they also have the electric loans and grants. And there's a new program about to come online that we've been working very closely with them to try and make sure those rules are a level playing field, once again, for our members as much as it is for any of the other incumbent players on the telecom side. That's great. You mentioned the FCC. Uh, one of the things that we've been hearing about in NRECA News and, and RE Magazine is this uh, FCC definition of what broadband is. Their definition says 25 megabytes per second uh, download, three upload. But most of the co-ops we're talking to are doing full gigabit fiber to the home. How is the FCC definition of broadband, how does that impact co-ops? Is that, an, is that a hindrance? Is that a good thing? What are you seeing in your, in your talks? Yeah, no, you are 100% right that when the majority of our members are deploying, it's at a much higher speed than the minimum definition of the FCC of 25.3. And the main reason is because a lot of our members are deploying fiber all the way to the home, which is you know the gold standard right now for broadband. We do have some members that are doing a, a hybrid of uh, fiber and fixed wireless, which is a little cheaper to deploy, but to a lower speed. So to get to the, the definition of what it means for 25.3, 25.3 is what the FCC defines as broadband. That's the minimum speed. Let's put it that way. So you can do most of the things you need to do if you have 25.3, but that's about it. And so that's today's standard. One of the problems we have is that the FCC hasn't revisited this in a while. And we're starting to see more applications, you know, heavy video use and downloading and um, more bandwidth heavy applications. 25.3 is not going to cut it in very near future. Uh, so most of our members have been looking beyond that. And we have encouraged the FCC to also revisit that 25.3 definition. If they're going to give out money to build a 25.3, that's meeting today's minimum, right? It's not going to necessarily meet the needs in the future. And we think that uh, as the federal government looks to put out its limited uh, resources towards broadband, it should look at higher speeds. And are we finding that uh, some of the bigger telecom companies are coming in, taking this, this federal money saying we're going to provide broadband, providing that bare minimum and then moving on, and then these communities are basically stuck in a rut? Is that a problem going forward? Yes, yeah, so that's safe to say. And as an example of that, a lot of the largest providers, the FCC came to them back in 2015 and said, we're going to provide you a statewide offer and you'd have to build out the broadband to all your communities to 10-1. So that's a six-year deal. So they are still getting money to build just a 10-1, which doesn't even meet today's standard. And by the same token, uh, that CAF reverse auction I mentioned, if a place already has 10-1, they're considered served, even though that doesn't meet the definition. So no additional money from the federal government can go out to improve their service. So there are some communities that are even being left behind at 10-1 at this point in time. And we don't think that's right. That's almost setting up a second-class citizen uh, status for some of these communities. No. Uh, one of the things we talked to Mike Kaiser about, and uh, Mike Kaiser is the CEO of Bark Electric. They're in the middle of a really ambitious 100% fiber to the home project down in the, in the mountains in southwest Virginia. One of the things he said was that if we don't build it, no one's going to. Is that an assessment that you find true, that in some of these territories, the big boys are just never going to come in? They're never going to serve these communities the way they need to be served. I hear that from across the country. It yeah. uh, doesn't matter what state it is. A lot of these communities, that's what's happening. One thing I hear from a lot of our members, I ask them, if you could do it over again, what would you do differently? And they often say, I would have gotten into this business earlier. They kept waiting, a lot of these members that I talked to, kept waiting for someone else to come in and solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And no one did. So it's usually a last resort uh, that they would jump into the business. And often it's really because their members demand it. They're hearing from their member owners, hey, we need this service. No one else is doing it. We need you to step in. So it's very much a grassroots effort. It's not that our members are going out of their way to jump into a new competitive business. It's a need there, and it's being driven by, by their community. Yeah. We mentioned earlier that uh, this is a strategic priority for NRECA. What can NRECA's members expect from the association going forward in terms of support and advocacy? I only see this uh, growing as a priority here at NRECA as more of our members get involved in broadband. There's a couple things that we're watching very closely. I think I briefly alluded to that the RUS is about to come online with a new broadband grant and loan program that we're working very closely with them on and our members will be very interested in. Also, the FCC has several issues in the hopper that we're very interested in. 
they are looking to do another auction, reverse auction of uh, money for broadband uh, in 2019 called the Remote Areas Fund. Mm -hmm. And this will be a pot of money that will go out to areas that were even too remote for the last auction, the CAF 2, that was held this year that we had uh, 31 members win in. So we don't know what that's going to look like yet, but it's a good pot of money that's going to be available out there to bring uh, broadband to these unserved communities. So I know that our members will be very interested in it. Uh, Obviously, we're continuing to monitor plenty of other issues uh, out there that uh, the FCC is working on. Poll attachments are always something kind of on the sideline that we're always paying attention to. That's great. I mean, it's a really important issue, and I really appreciate you coming on on the podcast and talking to us about it, Brian. Well, happy to be here, and I'm sure there'll be many more stories to come in the in the near future. Right. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. So this is really an important issue for, for co-ops and rural areas generally. I think it's something uh, that we're really just starting to scratch the surface on. Uh, there should be lots of movement on this issue in the next four or five years. Definitely a topic we'll be coming back to. So I want to thank my guests, Mike Kaiser and Brian O'Hara. Uh, also, thanks to you, our listeners, for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. You can find links and more information about this topic on our website, electric.coop. We'll be back soon with our next episode. Until next time, for Along Those Lines, I'm Scott Hoffman.